White, hello everyone. My name is Heather Simpson. I greet you in Sequamixon, the language of my First Nations ancestors. I am Sequamix from the Stoacham Hutlum First Nation and mixed European heritage. Uh, we are gathered today here on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Kakite, and Coast Salish peoples, uh, where our New Westminster campus is located. I am the coordinator of the Office of Indigenization here at JIBC. Uh, today we are in our Indigenous garden and I am joined by Mike Lassell, uh, who will introduce himself in just a moment. And Mike is here to share with us teachings about the native plants that are growing here uh, on these lands. Again, where we are situated, Musqueam and Kakite Coast Salish Territory. Yeah, as Heather mentioned, my name is Mike Lassell. I, I'm the nursery manager at Amsterdam Garden Centre. Uh, I've been in the gardening business for about 40 years now. I hold a diploma in horticulture from the University of Guelph in Urban Forestry. I'm an ISA certified arborist and a BC Red Sail land, landscape technologist. I'm also the author of three gardening books, A Grower's Choice, A Place in the Rain, Designing the West Coast Garden, and my most recent book, Extraordinary Ornamental Edibles, which included many BC native plants. So we're doing a little tour of the indigenous gardens here at the Justice Institute. It's a mix of non-native and native plants. We've got a lovely rose, Cupid's Kisses. Not native, but all roses have edible flowers and hips, including our native woodsy eye and Nukana or Nuka rose. So you can make, uh, you can candy the petals or you can actually make jellies out of the petals. It's quite delicious. On this side over here, we have an unidentified rubus or raspberry. It might just be rubus ideas, which is native to BC, but we'll know a little bit better once the fruit ripens and we're able to see it, and then we'll make a positive ID on the species. Moving down the line, we've got a very precocious patch of Melissa officinalis or lemon balm which makes a lovely tea, a calming tea. You can tell it's a member of the mint family with the square stem. So when you plant this in the, your garden, use a little caution or put a collar in, because as you can see, it really loves to spread. Over on this side, we've got a couple young plants, a Rebecca, again, we'll know a little bit later, later what that black-eyed Susan, which species it is. It looks to be, could just be Goldsturm. And then off to the left, some Achillea milfolium, which is native to BC. Again, we won't know if it's the native species with the white flowers till we see the blossoms, but we'll make that determination a little bit later. So we've got a lovely heart's tongue fern buried down here. This is a splenium scolopendrium. Uh, this is native to eastern North America. Uh, it has some medicinal use. The leaves were dried and they were used as a poultice for burns. It looks very exotic, but it's actually hardy to zone five and it's got some beautiful spores on the reverse of the frond there, like little hashtags. We've got a little red oak, Quercus rubra, sprouting up here. I, I don't doubt that that's just a gray squirrel bringing, bringing an acorn across. And then on this side, we have a, a mix of uh, English lavender, Lavendula angustifolia, which is uh, a lovely edible. Uh, you can bake the flowers into bread or mix them into vanilla ice cream. Beautiful for potpourri also, but you need to be careful how much you use because you can easily overpower any, anything you cook by adding too many flowers. We also have some pedicytes. Now we have several, uh, or colt's foot. I just don't know the species quite yet. We have two native species, if I'm not mistaken. But again, once we get some flower structure, we'll be able to ID it properly for you. We're gonna have a quick look at the trees surrounding the indigenous garden. Uh, they're all typical BC species. This is uh, Douglas fir, Sudasuga, Menziesii, named after Archibald Menges, the botanist. You can see some of them have green and uh, a few of them have a, a lovely blue tint to them. You can always do a, an easy ID with the pine cone because they have very distinct bracts coming out of the bottom. So it really distinguishes it from spruce and other coniferous species. Of course, behind me, we've got our red twig dogwood, Cornus stolonifera or sericea. You'll have white flowers and then berries afterwards. And this is a very important browse for deer, wild deer everywhere. It also will grow in very wet spots in your garden if you happen to have a space where you can't grow anything else. Yeah, we're looking back down at the indigenous garden at a nice patch of spearmint or Memphis Picata, uh, a great plant to use to make tea, a calming tea or mint jelly to serve with a little bit of lamb. 
As you can see, it's a little bit precocious being in the mint family, so it's sort of overwhelming the adjacent heart tongues fern. So if you want to keep it in your garden, you want to collar it or give it its own pot to grow it in. Off to my right is a very important tree to the indigenous cultures of BC, uh, Western Red Cedar or Thoya plicata. The bark was used to uh, stripped off and woven as clothing or made into baskets. The wood was used to make canoes and totems. And of course, it's a very important tree to our local forestry industry. Having a last look at the trees that surround the Indigenous Gardener at the Justice Institute, and we have a lovely little wild cherry here. Uh, we have three wild species in British Columbia, including Prunus virginiana. It's a little hard to tell which species this is in particular without it bearing fruit. They're quite easy to identify in the wild uh, with these lenticels or these pores on the bark. They look like little hash marks all the way across the stem. Very easy to see, even at a distance. We've just finished our lovely tour of the Aboriginal Garden at the Justice Institute and we're just outside the Aboriginal Gathering Place here on Coast Salish lands and I'm about to give you a tour of some nice native BC plants. Start off with red huckleberry. So here we have red huckleberry or Vaccinium parvifolium, a great edible berry with the tiny red translucent berries. Uh, indigenous peoples used to gather them using clubs hitting the shrubs uh, into ba woven baskets, or they made a comb made out of yew wood. Uh, they also used to brew the leaves to make a decoction for the, a sore throat. Uh, another native blueberry is Vaccinium ovatum, or evergreen huckleberry. This is a great ornamental plant to have in any garden. The berries are absolutely delicious. These were really important for late harvest for indigenous peoples. They're generally ready late autumn but they were, can actually be kept on the bush until about early December so I, again very important for a late harvest uh, they ate them fresh and they also dried them into cakes as far as uh, being an ornamental again it's an evergreen plant the new growth is a lovely coppery red and it's quite variable in its height uh, growing in the shade and seashell I've seen eight to nine foot specimens but it's a, one of the few berry shrubs that will actually produce fruit in full shade in full sun, it's quite compact, two to three feet. And the flush, the new, new growth flush is, is really beautiful, a, a vibrant copper red. We've got some, we have three species of Oregon grape in British Columbia. This is the most common, Mahonia aquifolium. Um, gets its name from the fruit, which of course, it's not quite that bright blue uh, grape-like fruit yet. Um, surprisingly, indigenous peoples did not eat these very often. Uh, but uh, I, I make a great jelly out of Oregon grape. It's a really popular plant now. It's a great ornamental because it'll grow in sun or shade. It's evergreen. And the yellow flowers are, uh, really do bring in the hummingbirds. So great little shrub to have in the garden. I brought a few samples in today. Um, um, I cycle every morning through a forest. This is vanilla leaf or Ockley's triphyla. Uh, Indigenous peoples use this as an insect repellent. They used to hang up bunches inside their homes. It has a very, when it's dry, it has a lovely vanilla scent to it. It grows in large patches and um, is a little hard to find in cultivation. So I'm lucky enough to live uh, near a forest where it grows naturally. I also brought you some uh, osoberry, um, formerly known as Indian plum. The Latin name is Omliria saraciformis. So it, gets its name from those lovely little plums. Uh, they start out yellow, then they go peach colored, and now they're getting very close to being ripe. They're not quite there. They're only ripe for about 10 days. I use these uh, in a preserve. I use about 90% wild blueberry, 10% of the oso berry. The oso berry has a very strong black cherry flavor. Indigenous peoples did eat these fresh, but infrequently because they have a very large pit and they're a little bit hard to preserve. I also brought some uh, nodding onion or Allium cernuum from my garden. So I grow this in a pot just outside my back porch. Everything's edible on this plant. So the, the bulbs were highly prized by indigenous peoples. They used to mark where the plants were in summer, go back in the fall and dig up, dig up the bulbs and then roast them till they're nearly black and then they're really sweet. But to be honest, I, I mostly eat the greens. It's like uh, 
it's like chai's on steroids. It's really got a great flavor. And the flowers, although they're not out yet, which are a bright pink, are also edible, but you have to break them up a little bit. Uh, otherwise, you'll be choking on them. So another grape berry that we've just discovered as a sort of a super fruit is, uh, oh, sorry, not that one, but this one, Galtheria Shalon, Salal. So uh, you can see you, um, the, it's just past its flowering stage now. Um, it was my grandmother who told me about this uh, when she lived in Vancouver in the 1930s. She used to go hiking with her dad on the North Shore before the Lionsgate Bridge was built, and this is what they used to snack on. Again, there's only about a 10-day to two-week window when they're really in their prime. Catch them too early and they're bland. Catch them too late and they're really mealy. But you get a salal berry in its prime and it's absolutely delicious. This was a very important edible crop to First Nations. They used to eat them fresh with ulicon grease and they used to uh, dry them. Uh, and they used to use the dried patties for trade. Not native to British Columbia, uh, but related, is another Galtheria, uh, Galtheria procumbens, or wintergreen. This is native to Eastern Canada. A very important uh, medicinal shrub. They used to make a, uh, a tea from the leaves for sore throats or upset stomach. It has a lot of properties that are very similar to aspirin. Um, when I have kids, unruly kids, in the garden center, I always show them bubblegum plant because if you break a leaf and you, and you split it open, it smells just like, this is where the original bubblegum flavor comes from. Also the wintergreen flavor that we use in toothpaste. Uh, moving on to another, this is a runcus. Uh, it's a tiny plant, really doesn't show it in its prime. When it grows up, it's about four feet tall. Looks like a giant white astilbe, for those of you who know what a astilbe looks like. This was an important medicinal plant um, Basically, it was used for smallpox and tuberculosis. So First Nations were still reaching out to the forest and the medicines they had in the forest after first contact. Uh, another one of my favorites, I use it more as a ground cover. This is Oxalis oregano or redwood sorrel. It's a really nice ground cover. As you can see, you get a little bit of a purple reverse on the leaf and a little bit of white flowers. Uh, First Nations in uh, Western Washington used to eat the leaves, hence the name sorrel. Nowadays, it's got a lot of oxalic acid, so it's not something we do these days, but again, traditionally eaten. Um, coastal strawberry, Fregaria chiloensis. So this is our original strawberry. This grows here in British Columbia in pure sand near the beaches. This is uh, one of the parents of our modern commercial strawberry. It was bred with Fregaria vesca to get what we have today. I've never eaten a really good strawberry from, these, from this particular species, but you know, when I read about it, it's all, they were only found certain clones in certain parts of the country where people went, where First Nations went to pick because they, they didn't always produce delicious berries. But it's a great plant for a ground cover because you can see all the baby plants will just root in. So if you've got a lot of sand and you're looking for a ground cover to hold a bank in, it's a great plant to choose from. Uh, this is our native columbine, or Aquilegia formosa. The Haida called it red rain flower, and they warned their children not to pick them or it would make it rain. So um, they also used to chew the leaves and spit it as a paste on, on a, uh, as a topical for a wound. And then uh, we'll look right into all the many ferns they brought. So licorice fern, so polypodium. Uh, this is the one you see growing on rocks or on big leaf maples on those branches. It's a great little plant. Uh, they used to, indigenous peoples used to chew the roots. It has a sweet licorice flavor. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can see the, no, there's no rhizomes developed yet, but if you've ever peeled them off rocks, you'll just see massive roots or thickened rhizomes there. Um, they will go summer dormant. So if they get dry in summer, all the leaves fall off. And when the fall rains come, it pops right back up again. So some people call it resurrection fern. Uh, ostrich fern or Matukia struthiopterus, this is where we get our edible fiddleheads from. I love this plant. Uh, tastes like asparagus when you cook it. So the trick is, it's only the unfurled fronds or croziers that are edible and they have to be cooked for 10 minutes. They are not edible raw. So, uh, but great plant to have in the garden. It's zone too hardy, so it grows Winnipeg, Saskatchewan, you name it, and it's indigenous across North America, mostly in northern latitudes, though. Then we have 
a very tiny ex example of our, our native sword fern, Polystichum mutatum. Of course, when they're mature, they have those big leathery fronds we're all familiar with in the forest. Uh, First Nations used to use these to line fire pits when they cook and to also separate foods that were stored in wooden boxes. And then finally, uh, a lovely little deer fern, one of my favorite evergreen ferns, great ornamental for the garden, but an important medicinal plant. Uh, indigenous peoples noticed that young stags would rub their heads, or the nubs, where the antlers fell off on that. So now they use so they learn from that, that the leaves are used as a topical for burns or sores on the skin. Kusechem, thank you so much, Mike. It was a pleasure to join you and uh, take a tour around our Indigenous garden today and learn more about the native plants that we're growing here in the garden and uh, uh, options for us to continue to uh, grow and uh, uh, see our garden thrive. And I know that we're really interested in um, growing some more edible native plants so that we can uh, really promote Indigenous food sovereignty and Indigenous health and, and cooking and medicinal uses of uh, our native plants. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me today.